Daniel Pomeroy, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm excited to be here. So let's just start high level. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about the Scientific Citizen Initiative. Yeah. Because online, this is what it says, and I quote, the <laughs> SCI, we're going to use SCI yeah, as the yeah. acronym. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Is a lab where we create tests and export innovative programs to enhance careers for STEM graduate students and elevate the depth and degree of meaningful interaction between scientists and society. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah. Tell us what it means. <laughs> yeah, I will definitely, uh, definitely unpack that a bit. Well, um, I guess at a high level, it's important to note that um, SCI really came about um, as a response to student demand um, for engaging with society. I think students are realizing more and more that uh, the research that they're doing is really butting up against really thorny um, questions, uh, ethical questions, um, and ones that society should have input on. Um, and so the program started about four years ago, and what we do is we create uh, new types of graduate training programs that provide students with the uh, skills and experience necessary uh, to think about how to engage communities um, both in their research process and you know to develop uh, career skills that they could use uh, to work in careers outside of academia. Um, I don't know how much more. So, so, so there was yeah. a need that was yeah. present. Tell us about that. Like, yeah. what were the students saying yeah. that prompted you to say the SCI, <laughs> or you and those early developers said SCI yeah, yeah. is the thing that we should build? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, so I would say our, our founding faculty director had a lot of those conversations. <laughs> but um, from my experience, I mean, there were students within our department who sent uh, a letter um, asking for things like public service uh, uh, requirements as part of their degree program. Um, and students really interested in things like science communication and science policy. I mean, from my experience, uh, I've done a lot in the science policy world, and I've had a lot of students ask uh, for me to create science policy courses. And when we did, they were, you know, all uh, enrolled by twice as many as we could accommodate and that sort of thing. So my experience with student demand is, is more on the day to day. Um, but I know that there were specific demands uh, prior to me uh, coming on. Uh, to SEI um, that were made of students by the department for things like public service requirements in their degree program, uh, realizing that science can't just operate in a silo and that uh, they really need to understand uh, what it means uh, for scientists to engage with communities. Yeah, and, ha and has that grown over time? So three years, three, four years, you said? Yeah. Is the demand grown? Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. Like as a, as the word got out about us, we've become more and more popular, <laughs> um, and the demand has grown not just among students, but also of other uh, organizations. And so, like uh, for example, the Broad uh, Institute of Harvard and MIT has asked us to come uh, help develop some programming uh, called the Societally Engaged Scientists, and we help. Uh, them think through what that should look like. It's a certificate program for their trainees um, and staff scientists uh, on sort of ethical societal engagement. Um, and places like that, or Boston University has also, mm -hmm. uh, we've uh, wrote grants together with them um, to think about how we really revitalize STEM graduate education mm -hmm. um, to include a lot of the components that are currently not taught at all, but students realize are, are important to being a sort of well-rounded uh, scientist and having real impact in the world. And so and students are doing this outside of their sort of required yeah. Yeah. curriculum. Can you tell us more yeah. about that? How are you finding ways to integrate yeah. this into their already <laughs> yes. very busy yes. schedules? Yes, so that's, that's tricky. And all of our programs are explicitly designed to not interfere with their academic responsibilities mm -hmm. because okay. we know that is the, the primary purpose for what they're here uh, to do and also, uh, you know, people, uh, uh, PIs of the students um, have, you know, very different opinions about extracurricular work. Um, so we address that in a couple ways. So first off, a lot of our courses are what um, the medical school calls nano courses. So mm -hmm. They're kind of workshop style. I think they work out to be either a third or a quarter credit. Um, and they take place basically two evenings for three hours each session. So it's something that students can manageably take um, mm -hmm. just kind of outside their normal work. Um, and then our civic science clinic um, is our experiential learning program that we run over the summer. It's uh, a fellowship that puts students in service to society, either working in the Massachusetts State House or mm -hmm. in Boston-based nonprofit organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a part-time program. So it's 10 weeks, 20 hours a week, and students explicitly have to get their uh, PIs sign off on participating in the program. So that way, 
Uh, we make sure that we don't interfere with their work. They also develop a work plan with their PI to make mm -hmm. sure that they have clear expectations for what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and surprisingly, even though these are all extracurricular and they take a lot of additional time, students still want to do it. Um, and so there's, uh, you know, demand um, is so strong <laughs> that even when they kind of receive no technical academic credit for yeah. their work or very minimal credit, they still take the time to do it. I mean, are students saying, I wish this was just part of my curriculum? Yeah. <laughs> they, they, sure. they are saying that. Okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was part of the impetus. Like I said, there was this letter asking for a public service requirement. But right. yeah, students would, I think, appreciate it if it was more of a core of their work. And I know that it's very like PI by PI, whether or not students feel like it's um, uh, sort of appreciated that they're doing this versus like kind of you know, an extracurricular activity on that's, yeah, that's yeah, that's on the side. And there are a growing number of faculty who I think realize that this is important for students. It's important for their career development. It's important for their well-being to understand like mm -hmm. why their science matters in the world. And it's important for the future of science that uh, scientists um, actually engage with society so that the research they produce is is you know socially acceptable and is actually solving problems people care about. Um, and so I think. Not all uh, faculty uh, sort of share that mindset, but a growing number do, and so they do encourage and support their students in doing this. Maybe expanding, shall we say? Yeah, right? exactly, um, exactly. And, it's, and a, it's a culture change, uh, long-term effort. <laughs> exactly. And, yeah. and CSI, and so there's so much we can talk about at CSI, and we don't have time for that. I'm hoping. SCI. I'm a, exactly. SCI. SCI. Yeah. Acronyms. Yeah. Yeah. We had Harvard. By there's way. so we, many of them. We had Harvard. Lots of acronyms. Different yeah. uh, acronyms to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, the Civic Science Clinic, you yeah. briefly mentioned it earlier. Yeah. Um, there was a precursor to this program. Yeah, yeah. Right? So tell us about what, what, what did you learn in that precursor program yeah. that, that said, let us create the Civic Science Clinic? Yeah. Yeah. So the precursor program was the uh, Massachusetts Science uh, and Technology Policy uh, mm -hmm. Fellowship. Um, and that uh, was modeled after a lot of the state fellowships. For example, California has the largest one that places scientists in the state government, in the state legislator, uh, legislature, uh, as part-time, uh, so, uh, sorry, as policy advisors to state legislators. Mm -hmm. uh, we, like I said, developed a part-time version of this to make it right. uh, accessible to students, um, partly on a quick sidetrack. So we did a report early on that looked at the career, uh, the skills necessary to make a transition uh, to careers in science policy. And one of the big uh, things that came out of that is, you know, some level of real world experience, mm -hmm. which students typically get from sort of science policy groups, etc. So we were thinking about how do we give students this experience um, in a way that they can do concurrently with their work so that when they graduate, if they want to go into science policy, mm -hmm. they have the background, they have the resume, they have the skills and experience uh, to make that transition. So that's what launched that program. Um, and uh, we received funding to do a three-year pilot. Uh, went really well every year. Demand grew both from the students and especially the state legislators. We <laughs> never could match the demand on that side. Because the students are placed with the yeah. legislature, right? Yeah, and directly. Over the, over yeah. the summer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're placed directly in an office uh, of a legislator, the state um, senator or representative or on one of their committees uh, uh, and they provide you know additional research support that oftentimes is lacking in the state house there are not a ton of people mm -hmm. uh, with stem backgrounds especially you know stem phd uh, in our case candidates um, and so they really are able to do a lot of analysis uh, and quick analysis pulling together a lot of different information sources that mm. uh, that every office has found very helpful and uh, everyone has reported that they would host a fellow again and tell a colleague and they must be telling <laughs> colleagues because we keep getting more the, and more requests. Yeah. And so they're, they're translating some of the research right for these legislatures so that yeah. they can understand. Um, I read online that the training, so they have a one day training, is that right? Yeah. Like for the graduate students. Yeah. Um, is what are they learning there in that one day that yeah. you think is enough mm -hmm. for them to yeah, do yeah. What they do? so because the program is is overall a training program the yeah. the one day is really to get them um orientated to the state house oh, and to engaging with policymakers. and so i think there are two uh two things that we hope that they take away from that training one is very functional it's how does the state house work like mm. how do you know bills get proposed and committees uh get formed etc cetera, etc cetera. um the other thing is that we try to incense, uh, 
science, right? We try to instill in them mm -hmm. uh, a sense of humility for the role science plays in public policy, because the worst thing for us would be if, you know, these students went into the state government uh, acting like they had all the answers, um, yeah. because we know science is just one of many inputs to public policy. Right. Um, and we do that, we actually put them, uh, all of our programs, I should have said, are uh, simulation based. Uh, and so we put them in different kind of role play simulations where they're trying to make policy decisions. Um, and through that process, get to learn in a very hands-on way uh, that science is just one of many inputs and that, you know, different choices can have uh, unexpected outcomes, et cetera. Right. So, um, so those are the two things we really try to prepare them for um, with the goal that like when they step in, they're, they're gonna be learning all the details of you know, what science policy is while they're there for the summer, but that at least they uh, have enough sort of orientation to come in, uh, know what they're getting into and doing it in a respect, respectful and responsible way. Yeah. And is it bi-directional piece of it? It's not that they're there to exactly, share yes, and show this yes, information. Yes. They're actually learning from yeah, yeah. Uh, the other staff as well, yeah. uh, which is important. Um, and so with the clinic, so this has been operating. Is it, is it you're about to close the application window or uh, are we in that process? Right yeah, now? so we just did, so we did three years of the State House Fellowship. Right, we right. expanded it to the Civic Science Clinic, mm -hmm. uh, which incorporated the opportunity to be placed in Boston-based community organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, we finished that pilot last summer. Mm -hmm. uh, we we're in the process of uh, doing a really in-depth evaluation of that um, and then applying to additional funding to okay. uh, continue and hopefully expand the program. <laughs> I see. I see. And you brought up a key word there, evaluation. Yes. And that's a whole dreaded word that yeah, yeah, program yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> director is always fearful of. Yeah. Tell us more about your philosophy around evaluation. What yeah, are yeah. things that you are keeping track of to say, if this happens, yeah. then we'll know <laughs> that what we're doing is working. Yes, yes. That is that is always a difficult question. <laughs> Uh, especially in a place like, you know, engagement with society, whether it be right. public policy or right. in the community, there's so many inputs that could affect the outputs and, uh, and the long-term impact. So um, what we do uh, currently is we do um, an evaluation at the end of the orientation and at the end of the program of uh, the students, of the uh, post offices um, or mm -hmm. organizations, um, and the PIs. Um, in the PIs, we just look for whether or not the students maintain their work and spend fine across the board there. Uh, and then offices and students, for now, it's self-reported impact, right? And the mm -hmm. offices actually mm -hmm. provide a good amount of detail of like the student informed of this uh, report, which led to this legislation. Um, and there we can draw some pretty sort of causal links that they're having impact. Uh, the students, a lot of what we ask them about is what um, sort of skills they learned and how mm -hmm. prepared they feel for future careers. and how interested they are in careers outside of academia. And so and in, let me yeah. jump in a little bit. So this is retrospective uh, yeah. evaluation in a way, right? They're yeah, looking yeah, back yeah. in that period of time where yes. they've joined, what changed yeah, in yeah. their yeah. skill set? Yes, yes. Continue, right? yes. So, yeah. so at the end of the, the program, we really look at you know how the program impacted students, host offices or organizations um, in the immediate. Um, in the longer term, we track uh, career outcomes of students. Mm -hmm. We've already had um, three different students uh, who've gone through SCI programs go on to do uh, policy fellowships, whether it be AAAS or the California one. Um, and in the sort of very long term, we also want to track how those work products, whether they be policy memos, legislation, reports, et cetera, uh, then actually, you know, go on to either be new legislation or be you know, legislation that is enacted. Mm -hmm. um, or with the community organizations, how the sort of educational programs or reports there are then used to make decisions. And so uh, in the long term, we really want to see, like, does the student engagement uh, impact the decision making process of the organizations? And does the engagement with the organizations impact the students career choices? Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll also say whether it impacts the way they approach research. And we've already had one student who reported like her engagement in the, the program has changed the way she's thought about engaging the community in her research. Yeah. Um, so those are the type of things we want to track in the long term. Uh, but that's a and, and it's yeah. and it's it's hard as you yeah. said, right? It's yeah, not yeah. easy. And you drop the one of the quotes on your website. Yeah. This is a, I guess from a student actually yeah, yeah. that says, and behind this shift in my worldview right, yeah, yeah. and ways of thinking, there's a huge amount of concrete knowledge and examples that I learned from this course. And yeah, yeah. You have a lot of courses that yeah, yeah. CI yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, provide. Um, is there a metric that you think a lot about in all of this sea of things you're tracking? 
Yeah. Um, so our metrics that we are currently analyzing right now mm -hmm. is we have a set of uh, learning goals that we hope our uh, courses will provide or our experiential learning will provide mm -hmm. um, and whether or not we're achieving those learning goals and how that impacts student careers. Um, and so it's different by each course. So each course like has a syllabus with these are the learning goals. Right. And we want to show that SEI's approach, which again uses uh, simulation based uh, pedagogy that puts students in difficult sort of decision making roles, actually prepares them for careers by providing skills that they're not getting in the um, in their traditional uh, academic career. Um, so that's the one we're currently focused on because that's the one sort of the university cares most about in the immediate term. Um, but then these longer term tracking things is really about how does this engagement change the way that students think about um, how to create dialogue with community mm -hmm. uh, in a way that's bi-directional and informs their work and is also helpful to the community. Uh, that's going to take some long-term tracking and uh, some uh, interviews, uh, qualitative interviews with right, students right. years out from doing the program. Uh, but those are the two things that we um, kind of are very focused on. Because um, this helps you tell the story about yeah. the impact that you're having. Yeah, and, and by yeah. the way, for those watching this, do go to the SEI, uh, SEI website because yeah. there's a lot of reports that you guys have put out. And yeah. the one you were referring to earlier is the 2021, I believe, right? That, yeah. uh, titled Science Policy Careers for PhD Training Scientists. Yeah. And in there, you had a breakdown of all the, the skill sets, if you will. Yeah, right? yeah. Science policy compared to science communication. Yeah, yeah. doesn't have sort of well broken down, like, like here is yeah. a bucket list of core skills yeah. right, that are there. So, you mentioned that you, you have all these stakeholders that are involved, right? I'm assuming yeah. you guys are engaging them throughout to thinking, what new thing do we design? Yeah. Right? What core skill do we need to focus on? Yeah. Like, well, a couple of comments. So first mm -hmm. in that report, we identified yeah. both skills and what we called mindsets uh, that uh, make um, scientists successful in the science policy world. Mm -hmm. And the two primary, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> um, the primary skill we identified uh, is communication, and then the primary mindset is a humility for the role science plays uh, in society. Um, and so that's um, those two things I think underlie a lot of uh, sorry a lot of SCI um, educational goals. Um, your question. It was, was more, more of a comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 your working with various stakeholders, right, to make these yes. decisions. Yes. Oh, sorry. The other, yeah, okay. Yeah. The other thing is all of SCI's programs are designed in a very intentional way, where mm -hmm. we do, um, for example, the Civic Science Clinic. We did a whole year of a listening tour of talking to mm -hmm. um, students, talking to um, administrators within Harvard, um, and talking to community organizations to really understand, like, what are their needs and how could this program benefit them. Um, and so I think it's really important, um, you know. To, to note that <laughs> that these programs are not just you know great ideas that come come from within SCI. They're uh, put together through dialogue with stakeholders um, to really be intentional. Um, and it takes longer <laughs> right. uh, than right. just throwing together a program that seems like a good idea. But I think it leads to like a more um, robust um, engagement right. um, and learning on all sides. And that takes time, right? Because yes. I think if you imagine there's a director, maybe a potential director of a program yeah. at a different university trying yeah, yeah. to do this, right? Yeah, yeah. What advice do you have for them? What, what landmines have you navigated successfully, yeah. right, to get here? And what are things that you're looking at, right, actual roadblocks? Yeah, now? yeah. So I'll make one comment for, <laughs> for anybody in academia. Um, one thing that, uh, yeah, so I'll just say one thing for, for people in academia, especially, you know, faculty or others trying to start new programs, is it's really important um, to, to be thoughtful about these things because the worst thing you could do is damage your relationship with the community and uh, we have lots of historical examples of, of that happening. Um, and I think there is a tendency, especially a lot of people in the tech world, to just, you know, uh, try new things, see if they work, if they don't iterate on that. Um, and I think that's the wrong approach uh, when it comes to engaging with communities. And so one of the things I work to do with our organization and others is, you know, develop a theory of change to really mm -hmm. think through, like, why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. um, and what is a, a way that we think will advance this? And then again, doing the stakeholder engagement, the listening tours, et cetera, right. um, are really critical to building new programs that exist at the interface of science and society. Uh, and so I would say, like, that's the biggest 
sort of thing I've seen people get wrong um, and the, the place where um, I think we've added a lot of value in our partnerships with other organizations. I see, yeah. And uh, in the sense that, um, you know, you have some numbers on, on, the, on the website, right? You've had, I believe, 12 fellows so far, right? Uh, or probably more right now. Yeah, more right? after this uh, last cohort. Last so I cohort. think the last cohort brings us up to 17. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, how many courses roughly do you, do you guys offer right now? <laughs> uh, okay, so let me count real quick. So <laughs> I, sh I should know this off the top of my head. Um, so, uh, well, okay. So one of the things is every year we try to innovate and create a new oh, nano course. So, um, so we're constantly adding to that. And right now we're finalizing one actually around uh, geoengineering. So like how scientists are thinking about uh, altering the, the climate of the planet. Uh, and it's a game where students play the role of different countries and in an international mm. delegation mm. making decisions around that. Um, so in any case, we've, we've made one of those every year. We're in the process of making one around uh, the um, history of racism and genetics um, uh, for genetics researchers to try not to not replicate that. Uh, to more directly answer your question, um, I think around 10 courses uh, right now, plus the experiential learning program. Mm -hmm. um, but again, our goal is to make a new one every year. Um, and then also to export them. So if you go to our website, there mm -hmm. are uh, instructor guides for one of our nano courses, um, as well as an online uh, open access uh, educational platform where mm -hmm. you can actually do one of the simulations yourself. Um, and then uh, there's a, a, you know, quite a bit of material for instructors who want to use this in their classroom uh, on how to debrief uh, the simulation in a way that gets at the learning Wonderful. goals. So, so, so are they... On that note, are they contacting you saying we are using your material? We just put it out a few months ago. Okay, so okay. we haven't, I think, directly through our website. However, we have worked with faculty out of other places like BU to uh, have them pilot our material in their classroom. So we have okay, done that and we okay. have gotten some feedback. Um, I don't know off the top of my head whether or not uh, somebody has responded to the one, the new one on the website see, yet. Um, but uh, go there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go, go check out the website. Uh, check out it's uh, on CRISPR gene editing, okay. uh, which is a hot topic. Um, and um, yeah, uh, okay. so that would actually probably be a better question for my co-director who <laughs> leads the curriculum. But it, in any know, case, we do have we do yeah. have experience piloting uh, other faculty teaching our courses. Right, so right. again, our goal is to like not just develop these for Harvard, right? Like it's really great that we can pilot them on Harvard students or find them, et cetera. But our ultimate goal is to export them so they're useful to uh, the broader scientific uh, community. And that could be even a potential metric you can track over time where your yeah. seeds have landed. Yeah, yeah right? exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we do have all those built into the website, but it's actually if an instructor, this is why I probably have to open, open the box at some point, but uh, when they go into the simulation, they have to fill out, are you an instructor? Do you plan to use this, et cetera, et cetera? So we, we might have some metrics there already, but uh, we are collecting them for a little while before we okay. look <laughs> to okay. see. A lot of tips here, guys. So yeah. many, so many tips. Yeah. <laughs> I want to ask this question because I think it doesn't get asked enough. Um, for the public, right, what should they know about what you're, what, what SCI is trying to do? Yeah. Because we tend not to think about them, um, at least in your programs, you do have community side of things, but yeah. If a community member is watching this right now, yeah. um, what do you, what words do you have for them? <laughs> what should they care that you're doing this? Yeah, I would say it's a lot of ways to answer that question. <laughs> um, I think we think about changing the culture of science to make sure that scientific research uh, is more reflective of society um, mm -hmm. and society's values and interests. I think a lot of people uh, in the community, um, outside the scientific community, sort of see this disconnect between science and society and feel uh, sometimes that, you know, scientists um, don't really care what the public has to say or think um, and are just doing the research that, that they find interesting. And I think uh, this is a long term, uh, in the long term, this isn't a sustainable relationship between science and society. And so, what we would like to do in the long term is ensure that science is working alongside society uh, to really um, take in input from the community and solve their problems. Um, and so to the community, I would say, uh, 
we're, we're working on a long-term effort to make sure science helps you. <laughs> and I think there's not a better place yeah. to finish this conversation. Now, we need to have you back because we're literally just scratching the surface yeah. here and there's so much more to unpack. Yeah. As I mentioned, the reports, there's tons of reports and I'm yeah. betting you're working on a few others. Yes, yes we have, you know? have a couple others. I, I'm working to edit and finalize one that's been on the... the radar for a while on yeah. institutional change in academia. So it actually relates to that last topic of thinking about how do we ensure our programs are, uh, you know, not just helping, you know, the individual students that we're working mm -hmm. with, but really think about how that can lead to this long term culture change where science is working alongside society. So uh, it is it is on my to do list to finalize that <laughs> one and get it out there. Uh, we'll also have an evaluation report coming out soon. Yeah, um, and yeah. so, yeah, there's more to come. <laughs> so, yeah, and we're, we're going to have you back for sure yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. to chat about this. Uh, yeah. Daniel Pomeroy, thank you so much. Cool. Great. Thank you. It's uh, great to do this. I really appreciate being invited. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. <laughs>